So it's three o'clock in the morning on the 21st of August, 2018. I'm lying in my bed and I can't sleep. And the reason why I can't get any sleep is because I've been running on one of the biggest adrenaline rushes I ever had in my life leading up to that date. Hi, my name is Stuck, and this is my talk from zero to MVH without knowing how to write a single line of Python code. So the reason why this whole thing happened has nothing to do with me or my skill set. It had all to do with me being at the right place at the right time and understanding what to do with it. As a profile in the bounty community, I get asked on multiple occasions every day on different social media platforms. Stuck, how do you get started in bug bounties? And it's been like that since I released my first vlog and started my own journey about two years ago. In the beginning, I would say something like, uh, go read Pete Jaworski's, Jaworski's book or buy, the web ha hack or buy the web application hacker's handbook. But to be honest, those were good recommendations at that time. But today, the more I learn about this space is that I don't have any simple answer anymore. It's 2020 and there are so many different paths to choose. And it can literally be overwhelming just even to choose your path. How do you as a seasoned pen tester looking to get some side cash or an absolute beginner that's wanting to change their life, break into the hacking space that we all know as bug monkeys. I don't have a universal answer for this, but I have my own experience, both good and bad, and I'll do my best to share that experience with you. One of the first questions that usually get asked is, what program language should I learn? And my answer would be, select one that resonates with you, a language that you like. It's just like learning any kind of other language, right? Just because a huge part of the world's population speaks Mandarin Chinese. Maybe Spanish is a better fit for you. Learning is so much easier when you're having fun and not forcing yourself. So choose a language that you like and then you stick with it. It could be JavaScript, Go, Bash, Rust, Ruby, or even Python. The choice is yours. So what choice did I do? I didn't do any of that. <laughs> I focused on, what I did is the opposite. Instead of learning any programming language, I focused on um, business logic. So I spent a lot of time trying to identify and understand file upload vulnerabilities and business logic. Because that was something I was more comfortable with. I don't have a developer's background, so for me starting to learn a language before I started hacking was going to be a very steep uphill ride for me. So I'd rather go for something that I understood. And that is the reason why I couldn't sleep that night. Because on the 21st of August, Tavis dropped the ghost script bug. And in 24 hours, I made more money than I did in a whole year leading up to that. And it's an understatement to say that I got bitten by the bounty bug that night. Because I spent 20 hours writing the POC, getting that payload to work, uh, eventually smuggling things over uh, DNS to show impact. And, and I learned so much during those hours. And the most important takeaway of that was that I realized at that time that it was possible. I could find crits. And I've been continuing doing that ever since. For me, it was a mindset. I can do this and that is possible for you too because they are out there. We just need to look for them or understand how to train ourselves to look for them. All this comes from luck and experience because you see something, you recognize it and you know what to do with it. And one of the other questions that I usually get is, 
Stack, do you know any easy programs for beginners? And the short, short answer here is sadly, no. Because I, I have no idea what your background is or what's your skill set. Maybe you've been into mobile app development for the last five years and know everything about mobile apps. Then definitely that's an area for you. Maybe you never even open Chrome DevTools and have no understanding of the basics of networking at all. Then there's gonna be another path for you. The thing is that there is actually no easy programs. This is bug bounties. And you're hacking on some of the most hardened targets on the market. And if you find easy bugs, then you can bet your ass it's gonna be a dupe. But set it in anyway. Practice writing that report. A bug is a bug, a dupe or not a dupe. And it will help you with your scoring and your self-esteem. The concept here is simple. Celebrate all your wins. Found a bug? Yes! Triasha said she's a dupe. Found a bug! But how do you then practice? How do you build a skill set? If you're not able to find bugs, or if you don't even know what a bug looks like, well, there's a lot of different stuff and places we can practice on today. There's OWASP Use Lab, there's Portswigger's Web Application Academy, and there's platforms dedicated to this kind of stuff, like Try Hack Me, Hack the Box, and Pentester Labs. All of these are amazing and super fun platforms but they aren't hardened live targets. These are designed to have vulnerabilities. And they're good practice rounds, but they will really differ from the real world, unless it's a defined one to look really much like a real world vulnerability. And to be honest, I didn't do any of that. Because I, what I did is I created a habit of always having burp running, no matter what I did. I turn off, turn off all the active scanners and I enable as many passive ones that I could. Sure, Burp ate almost all my RAM all the time, but that was a sacrifice I was willing to make. And then I put that on my secondary screen, where I had Flower Logger++ always running. So I got used to see the traffic that flew th flowed through my browser. And I, without really knowing in the beginning what I was looking at, I can see how my browser communicated with the servers and I learned how web apps communicated. Now I know most of the HTTP status codes by heart and the things that I miss, the passive scanners will eventually show up, like misconfiguration or maybe some information leakage because I've been adapting some things that I learned along the way to alert me for that. And just like Tank in the Matrix, I got used to identify the anomalies. So inside the request flow, maybe the reply was a bit too big, or maybe there was this weird error code coming back. Maybe there's a 500 where it's not supposed to be. And I trained myself to ignore everything that was normal and to look for the stuff that stood out. I kind of built that mentality and just like CLC would say, hmm, that's interesting. And I would dig into that. Sometimes it was nothing, but sometimes it turned, in, turned out to be something really, really interesting. Just like the Tumblr bug that I found in 2018 that was identified and fixed within 12 hours. And that was primarily due to watching the responses. Okay, 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 I get it. But seriously, how do I start to look for security bugs? The simple answer here is that you start. Because taking action is everything that matters. One of the most important things that I've learned in life is not to compare yourself with others. This has been especially proven useful at live hacking events. You're surrounded by some of the best brains in the community in a highly competitive environment. It's a first come, first serve kind of situation. 
And you're all looking at the same target that's been a public program for a couple of years. What are the chances there will be any bugs there? There surely can't be any bugs there, right? But if 30 to 40 hackers that spent everything from a few weeks to a couple of days can make 500,000 to almost a million dollars in one evening, the limitation isn't the availability of bugs, it's the mindset of the participants. So if you decided to be one of the few that actually do want to start and not just read all the write-up and do the do doom scrolling on the infosec on Twitter and just waiting and waiting and waiting for that perfect moment when to begin, then the key is to always approach the target like you're the first one there. Imagine that just seconds before you hit that URL in the browser, boom, the devs just pushed a fresh commit. It's all yours and it's bugs everywhere. All you have to do is to use your methodology and look for them. Now that sets the intention and that's the way how you will find the bugs. I'm a vivid burp user and I realized that tools, um, I, don't, I don't need to understand how to build them, how to use them. It's like I, I don't know how to build Microsoft Office Word, but I can use that to write stuff. Later on, that would be helpful to understand how scripts work or maybe, you know, how tools work. But in the beginning, all you need to do is to master the tools that are out there. So learn how to use Nmap or learn how to use Burp or your browser or dev tools. You don't under need to understand fully how they work. You just need to understand how to run them. So if your recon game isn't that strong or you're a non-dev person, Instead of just going for the breath and building your massive recon automation infrastructure, maybe going for depth will work for you. Then it doesn't hurt to have that mega automation so you can feed the bugs you find into that and then eventually find the bugs automatically. So you've done all your recon. You have all these great subdomains and you have this main app and you're ready to get started. But, but where do you begin? How, how, do you, how do you sign up for it? Is there any third party involved? Any single sign-on, OAuth? Is there any emails coming out? Is there two-factor enable? And what kind of services does it use? Where is it hosted? Is it running on Windows or Nginx? Does it live in AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, or is it self-hosted? All these things play a big role in what you can extract later on if you find things like SSR, FRCs and similar bugs. Is there any file uploads within this application? Maybe there's a profile page with an avatar on it. Does that app also support imports and exports of user data? Can you play around with that? What happens if you're on the avatar page and you upload and you change the content of the file? How does the app deal with that? How does it deal with getting a PNG file with the contents of a TIFF file but has PDF as the content type? I've found some really interesting stack traces using this technique. Sometimes even hidden within the file itself after the file has been uploaded. Is there any API on the application? If so, how does it work? Is there version one, two, three, and so on? And what happens if you take a request from version three and run it through version one? Does it have any mobile app that you can use and interact with? Maybe it talks directly to the API. Maybe it uses some other endpoints that your web app can see that's mm, juicy and not really secured. And it's always good to check if there's any kind of user levels within the app, you know, Hey, sign up two user accounts. One that's going to be admin and one that's going to be user. Then take the cookies from the low privileged user and smash them into authorize and walk the website as admin. If user can do the same thing as admin, problem. 
is there maybe some weird business logic there? Maybe some parsers, maybe some PDF exports, printouts? Is there any internal pesky squid proxies that stops you from getting that iframe working in your PDF export? All these things are possible for you to test for and identify without having to know a single line of code or write any scripts. It's just right there in the traffic between your browser and the server. Collaboration. Most of the things that I've learned during the last few years, I picked up by collaborating with friends. In the beginning, I was trying to learn burp together with my friend Lon. And as soon as I learned some of the stuff and new concepts and techniques, I tried to share them with others. Because teaching others forces you into really deeply understand the concept. Because it's really, really hard to explain something super technical in simple terms for somebody that has no understanding what you're talking about. I've always stated that I love people more than I love computers. And believe me, I love computers a lot. So I really love people. So when there wasn't a world lockdown, uh, I spent most of my spare cash to travel to conferences to network and meet people and learn from others and eventually get to the stage where I get to share what I have learned. I join forums, Slack channels, and hey, now we got discords and, and all these places where people can meet and just at least start to collaborate. But to be honest, I've really never been a pure team player. All my interest when it comes to sports has always been tilted towards the kind of solo activities. So um, I wasn't the big soccer guy, but I really, really enjoyed doing things in a group setting, like skateboarding, skeet and marksmanship shooting, cooking, and hey, even competitive speed cubing. That's things that you're doing as an individual, but you're doing it together. And the same thing goes for hacking. The thing is that we don't exactly do the same thing, but we're doing it together. And so when you're collaborating with someone, you're also kind of learning from each other because you're seeing different kind of views. And I really enjoy collaborative hacking. Hacking with friends and winning with friends is something that I value more than doing it on my own. And I've been really, really blessed to win not only one belt for the most valuable team award with the 1993 Karate Gailiwackers, but also win the best team award with Disturbance. And if you're deciding to collaborate with someone while doing bounties, just make sure that you set a couple of clear goals or clear rules before you begin. Because when money is involved, things get tough. And believe me, it's never worth losing a friend over a bounty. So before you begin to do a full collaboration, just define, should we do a 50-50 split? Or even a 60-40 where the finder gets the bigger cut? Or how do we deal with the aftermath? CVEs and additional stuff. If a bug surfaces at a later stage, do the original finder get that an extra finder's bonus? Because they kind of created the payload that the rest of the group gets to share. All these are things that are super important to have defined before you begin. Because if you don't, it can become extremely salty afterwards. And like I said, it's not worth losing friends over. Making money is easy, but maintaining long-term relationships, that's hard. Thank you for uh, listening to my talk. It's been a pleasure presenting here. 
Um, I hope to see you again in the future. Um, stay curious.